Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Well, in recent weeks, Sustain.Life, a company co-founded by Wexford entrepreneur Mike Hanrahan, was acquired for $100 million. Hailing from New Ross, this marked Mike's second successful exit, having previously sold Jet.com to Walmart. So what is the secret to Mike's success? He joins us now to reveal all. Mike, start by providing us with an insight into the journey that brought you from County Wexford to the US. Thanks so much, Carl, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I grew up in New Ross, Carl. I um, lived there till I was 23, did six years working in Waterford at PwC, where I got a fantastic education in, in business and entrepreneurship, uh, which I think has stood me in good stead. Uh, I think like a lot of people in the sort of mid-90s, I moved over to London uh, when I was 23, did 14 years over there where I really sort of transitioned from the accounting world into the technology world. And I started building various risk and trading systems at a, a bunch of different banks over in the UK. And then in 2010, uh, I was very fortunate to have a good friend of mine, a guy called Mark Laurie, who I'd worked with in London, contact me and ask if I'd be uh, happy to move over to the US to help run technology at a business that he was uh, starting to grow pretty rapidly at that point, a company called Cypress.com. And my wife and I just had our second child in London, and we were very excited at the opportunity of moving to the U.S., and we, we jumped at it. And, um, yeah, things have gone very well since. Your first successful exit, of course, was Jet.com. How did you develop the idea for this e-commerce site? When I was at Cypress.com with Mark, uh, that was a sort of category specialist e-commerce platform. So... We had specialist sites in diapers, for example. We had specialist sites in toys and in other categories. And um, that was a company that was bought by Amazon. And so, you know, we got a very good and interesting insight into the whole world of e-commerce during that sort of post-acquisition period. And I think we learned a lot from everything we had done at diapers.com. And it sort of really put it into our head that, you know, there is actually room here for another Amazon-like competitor, but possibly one that can have second mover advantage is what we used to call it, where we've learned a lot from how Amazon has built up their infrastructure and their scale, and we can possibly you know, skip a few lessons and, and maybe have a more efficient e-commerce channel. So that was really the premise for, for Jet.com. And um, you know, really, I think that sort of focus on cost and, and providing consumer value is ultimately probably what attracted Walmart as they started looking at and um, you know, ultimately acquired us. And prior to being acquired by Walmart, were you growing the business with such an acquisition in mind? I wouldn't say it was a principal strategy that we had. When, you know, when we were raising money, I think our goal was always to take Jet.com to scale and, and try and be a, a competitor to, to Amazon. I think when we started having partnership conversations with Walmart to sell on our platform, because we had a marketplace component on the platform, I think it was very much a meeting of minds between Mark Laurie and Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart at the time. And we could see that Walmart were incredibly invested in becoming number two in e-commerce. They had a strategy and a scale that was um, you know, going to be very hard to beat once they sort of got, got themselves up and running. They also had an incredible direct fresh business, which was going to drive a huge amount of e-commerce growth for them in the future, which we could see. And as we talked to Walmart, from a partnership perspective, I think, you know, it became obvious that actually a, a, a deeper partnership or an acquisition or sort of meeting, meeting of, of the teams would be a much better outcome for, for both companies. And so as we developed and nurtured that relationship with Walmart, I think it became obvious that an acquisition was going to be the best play for both parties. And what was your experience of the acquisition process, particularly when an organization the size of Walmart was involved? Yeah, you know, they're obviously a very, very different organization to what Jet was. As I said, they they are, um, you know, they're almost like a small country. I actually compare them to Ireland quite a bit. You know, they have about 2.2 million employees, which is, you know, a little bit less than the working population of Ireland. Their their revenue annually is $650 billion, which is not too far off the GDP of Ireland. And so, you know, they're a huge, huge organization and akin to a small country, as I said. And so for them... To be successful, they're very operationally focused, right? A 1% mistake in any direction can cost them $6, 7000000000 billion. And so that type of operational mindset is very, very different from a startup company that's very entrepreneurial, that's sort of moving fast and breaking things, that's trying to innovate very quickly, where innovations can have, you know, a 10x multiplier effect. You know, that's a, 
a very different type of culture and a different type of employee who's attracted to that type of business. And so, um, you know, I think there was a lot of pros and cons, really, in, in uh, integrating ourselves into Walmart. Certainly the cultures were very, very different. But, I, you know, I like to think that hopefully the, the teams in Walmart learned a lot from our teams, and, and I know for a fact that our teams learned a huge amount from Walmart. I had a five-year earn out there, and I learned an incredible amount about just how to operate a business at scale, a business that's running, um, and how to sort of think at the level and scale that, that Walmart provides. And so I think there was a good sort of symbiotic effect of, of both those companies coming together. And by the end of the earnout, did you already have other business ideas in mind? I did. I did, yeah. I, you know, we thought a lot during our time at Walmart uh, about what we wanted to do post my earnout. And when I say we, it's myself and my two co-founders at Sustain, Patrick Campagnano and Emily Bloomfield. Um, and so we had a lot of conversations about what we, we would do uh, when, when I was finished at Walmart. And I think, you know, we, we honed it down relatively quickly. We know, we're very, very good at building enterprise software. That's what I've effectively always done, either in banks or in e-commerce or a retail uh, sector. Um, and so, you know, something in the enterprise software space was, was obvious to us. And, uh, you know, the three of us had a passion for, for climate change. I, I have been trying to make my own home carbon neutral here in the U.S., and I found that incredibly difficult. And that sort of had me thinking about, well, if it was so hard for me, who's, you know, technical and interested and motivated to do it, you know, what, what hope do companies have of becoming carbon neutral, where um, it's not going to be the number one priority, where there's a lot of competing resources inside a company, uh, where the sort of tools and systems are not placed to help them even understand what their carbon footprint is. And so... Um, you know, that experience of me trying to make my home, home carbon neutral, I think it's shone a real spotlight for me, a uh, gap in the market of being able to provide really good enterprise technology to corporations so that they could start on that same journey themselves. So, Mike, you changed to a new industry for your next business, to the environmental sector with Sustain.Life. Provide us with an insight into that business and the services it provided. Yeah, so Sustain Life was really a, a, an enterprise software company. Um, our uh, principal product was designed to help companies uh, measure and manage their carbon emissions. And there's a requirement for that in the U.S. was driven by really two key things. You've got corporate compliance programs, meaning companies like Microsoft, Walmart, Amazon, all are starting to require their suppliers to report on their carbon emissions, both in total and at the product level. And then additionally, you have... Um, regulations in the U.S., principally from California, but then SEC is starting to uh, roll out its regulations in the carbon accounting space. And so we knew there was going to be a big appetite, a big demand for this type of software coming on stream. You know, really in sort of, we had predicted somewhere in the sort of 2023 to 24 time frame, which is, you know, actually exactly what happened. And um, the software is very much like an accounting platform, although actually ends up being a lot more complex than an accounting platform just because the data requirements you have for something like carbon accounting really traverse a whole gamut of systems inside a company. So you're connecting into um, financial accounting systems, into logistics systems, into travel systems, into all the utility information, into the meter level readings, into their uh, power utility bills. And so it's really a, a very sort of integration-heavy, data-heavy type of platform. And, you know, that's something that our team really excel at building. And so built that together and, and, yeah, started selling it into the enterprise market here in the U.S. And, um, yeah, it was it was uh, very well received. What level of growth did you achieve with Sustain.Life? We initially were targeting the sort of SNB sector, the sort of small to medium-sized business sector. Um, and we had a free product actually there, which had explosive growth, um, you know, thousands of companies signed up actually in the first couple of months. We struggled to get any of them to actually convert to paying customers just because they didn't have the sort of regulatory or corporate uh, compliance imperatives that some of the larger companies did. And so that was probably late 2021, early 22. We took a decision then in sort of Q2 of 22 to actually move the product up market and start focusing on the sort of mid-market enterprise sector and then sort of go from there up into the larger enterprise sector. And so as we moved through 22 into 23, um, we saw incredible growth. I think we had, uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, roughly like 16x growth in 22 versus 
21 and then sort of four or five that makes that again in in 23 um and 23 was really when that market started to crystallize here in the u.s because prior to that you didn't have those corporate or uh, state level um, regulations or requirements that companies needed and so uh, you know, the market really started to take off in 23 and, and grew massively, continues to grow massively. I mean, it's still, I would say, a very, very nascent market. Um, the SEC regulations are being challenged in the courts here in the U.S., which has kind of caused a lot of companies to push the pause button. Um, and, you know, most companies still don't have this type of technology in, in, internally. And so uh, I think it's going to be a huge, huge market. You know, we had research that shows that this market's going to be worth uh, 26 billion by 2024, from you know effectively zero in 2023. So it, it's going to be a huge, huge market. The sustained life business was recently acquired by Workiva for 100 million dollars. But how did that transaction come about? We had been talking to Workiva from a partnership perspective um, since probably Q1 of this year in 2024. So a lot of so what Workiva do is they do a lot of integrated reporting for a lot of public companies globally. Um, and when the SEC in the U.S. came out with their new carbon accounting regulations, Workiva were looking for a partner who could help them drive the data requirements to be able to fulfill those regulations. And so they had that requirement. At the same time, some of our clients on the Sustain Life side were asking if we could integrate with Workiva ourselves because they were, you know, they were also customers of Workiva and were wondering – uh, if our platform could push our push the data through into them, and so um, we were in partnership conversations with those guys. We at the same time were starting to do our Series A fundraising, and you know, typically in a, in a Series A for an enterprise software company, you want to have a mix of straight up venture capital firms, but also ideally some strategic corporate investors. Um, and so we'd been talking to to some you know potential corporates with a longer-term view of acquisition in our Series A process. Workiva were one of those uh, firms, and, you know, we were um, presenting to them, you know, our, our sort of strategy and growth and, you know, details about the team and all the rest of it from a Series A fundraising perspective. And ultimately they, you know, liked, uh, very much liked what they saw and came back and said, well, let's skip past the Series A and we we'll just acquire you guys, which I think was a fantastic outcome for, for both sides. As somebody that has had two very successful business exits, for those thinking of selling their businesses, what advice have you got for them? Yeah, um, I think we're in, you know, we, we've had a, a very interesting period over the last four to five years from a valuation perspective, largely driven by interest rates, as, as I'm sure you're aware. And, you know, valuations were a little wacky there for maybe two to three years, right, running from sort of 2021 up to sort of maybe late 2022, early 2023. And I think that's created a sort of interesting psychological dynamic for a lot of founders that, you know, they may have raised money at a very high valuation or they may have seen some of their peer companies raising money at extremely high valuations. And it's anchored some people, I think, in valuations that are maybe not realistic and not justified by the current interest rate and funding environment. And so, you know, I think one of the things I would impressed upon entrepreneurs who are sort of thinking about valuing their business or selling the business is, you know, take a sort of realistic step back and look at your comps and your multiples. Once you get yourself over that sort of hurdle, and it can be sometimes unpleasant, obviously, to, to have that conversation with yourself, um, I think in terms of actually selling, um, yeah, number one thing for me would be find a company that, that shares your values. Um, you know, I've been through a number of acquisitions at this point. I think Workiva is probably the one I'm most excited about. They were absolutely fantastic company to work with, very much shared the values of our companies. Culturally, we felt that it was a fantastic home for our employees. Um, and, you know, that was the impression we had even before going into the deeper negotiations with them. But through the process of selling to them, you know, they really were as good as the word on all of that stuff. They were um you know, really great to work with, very understanding of our size as a company and you know, the resource constraints we had in working with them and understood some of the motivations for our staff and why they were at Sustain and, and you know, we're going to be able to sort of maintain those, those types of um, motivations or incentives for staff. And, you know, having that cultural connection between yourself and a potential inquirer, I think, is, is really, really important. So what is next for Mike Hanrahan? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I'm definitely going to take some time off. I promised my wife I'd take at least a year off. 
And I think I'm going to take some time out and, and sort of really think about, do I want to get into this again? You know, as you said, it, it can be stressful. I'm, I'm only 50 years old at this point, and uh, I, I definitely think I have one or two more more confidence in me. But we'll, uh, we'll see. I'm certainly not going to make any decisions for another 12 or 18 months. I presume, though, if you do get back into the tech space again, AI will be a big feature of any product that you develop? Yeah, I think that's probably actually a fair assumption, Carl. I'm, I am actually starting to invest a lot of time and energy into understanding space, AI space uh, even more. You know, I ran the computer vision AI program at Walmart for almost five years. So it's a space I'm very familiar with, but um, you know, really trying to make sure I'm sort of keeping up with what's happening in that space and thinking about potential opportunities. And yeah, I think there's a lot of money and noise and hype around that space right now and i think that will sort of settle down in the next 12 to 18 months but i think it is going to be a transformative space and it's definitely something i'm going to look at deeply and you know having had plenty of experience in the space and having you know relatively good network of people that i could call on if we wanted to build a product in that space it's definitely something that's that's on the radar for me so I do think AI is going to be increasingly transformative in the years, years ahead. So um, definitely be interested to see how we can um, yeah, do some work in that space. And Mike, finally, for any budding tech entrepreneur listening this morning, what advice have you got for them? Yeah, I think there's a few things. You know, for me, I think the number one thing is always just have that self-belief. You know, take a bet on yourself and, and believe in yourself. I think uh, the world of entrepreneurship is one of asymmetrical risk, meaning that you know, the downside of something is typically not so bad. If you're a smart entrepreneur, worst case scenario, maybe you've lost a year or two of your life uh, to to a startup that doesn't work, but you can always go back and get another job um, and, you know, start again, basically. That's, you know, that's almost the worst that can happen. And in that process, you'll probably have learned a lot. And the upside is, is obviously potentially huge if you're successful. And so, uh, you know, recognizing that fact and taking a bet on yourself, I think, is really, really important. So, uh, you know, I would always encourage people to, to take the risk and go for it. I think the second thing is, you know, try and find great people to work with. Uh, it's really hard to do anything exclusively on your own. Or if you're sort of one of these people who micromanages people or uh, needs to be involved in everything, I think it's just very hard to scale yourself, even if you're, you're very good at that type of thing. And so I think having a team that you can call on, who you can delegate to, give them you know, empower them to, to act and to do things. And, you know, that's the only way you can move fast and get high throughput and, and innovate. So having that team is, is really, really important. And I think thirdly, you know, lesson that it took me a while to learn is, you know, don't be afraid to take outside capital. I had a number of smaller startups in London with a good friend of mine, and we, you know, we never took outside capital. And we had this sort of maybe Irish mentality of, you know, felt like we were borrowing money or something like that, and we just didn't feel comfortable doing it. And we had some great ideas, I think, that could have been hugely successful had we taken on the outside capital to do it. And so, um, you know, understanding the importance of, of capital and, um, yeah, not being afraid to, to take that on, and, you know, in whatever form, be, be it debt or equity, uh, I think is, is really important as well because, you, you, you know, you're never going to get to scale. It's a, it's a global world with a lot of capital out there. People in the U.S., uh, you know, startups in the U.S. are very much in the sort of mind share of, yeah, let's go get some VC money, let's go get some institutional money or whatever it is. And that typically hasn't been the way I think people in the U.K. and Ireland think. And so, um, but that's your competition, right? And so you're going to get that resourced if you don't take that capital on. So that'd probably be the third thing I would say. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was New Ross native Mike Hanrahan. And I'd like to thank Mike for sharing his incredible success story with us this morning. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.